G'day! Welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Blue. Today's special guest is Battlefield Guide for Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours, Pete Smith. And Pete has joined us today to talk about Commonwealth War Grave Cemeteries, how they work, and how they came into fruition during the Great War. Hi, Pete. Thanks for joining us. On- Adam, good to be with you again. Thanks, Pete. It's it's a privilege to have you back on and talking about Commonwealth War Grave Cemeteries. So cemeteries, they're right across the Western Front and, and right across the world. There's different types of cemeteries. And, and for you, visiting cemeteries is... So for most people, it's yeah, is usually not something that many people want to do as they think it's a bit morbid or depressing. Have you always had an interest in cemeteries and in particular military cemeteries or was it something that you gradually became interested in when you became a battlefield historian? No, it goes uh, it goes a long way uh, a long way back, really. I suppose into into my childhood. Um, my parents were very interested in history, uh, both mum and dad. Uh, dad was a bit of an amateur historian, and uh, uh, my mum was a bit of a, a, a rummager in junk shops and uh, and antiques and things. So they both had this love of history. And one of the things we used to do as kids were we'd go and have a look at the church, and uh, and we'd have a gallop around the the graveyard and. Have two brothers and it was the one that could find the oldest grave or the one that could find the most interest, interesting inscription now I know it might sound odd to a lot of people but I just loved it I just found it fascinating because I had this love of history and and I suppose it also gave me a love of architecture as well and and the craftsmanship of, of some of the uh, the older headstones that we see I mean when I visit Australia I do it there as well I always go to the cemeteries of every little you know, kind of town that uh, I visit I go and have a look and see what's in the cemetery you just learn so much about local history by going as well as national history by going and having a look at cemeteries no so my interest in cemeteries goes back a long way so before the creation of the imperial war graves commission what was the british empire's usual practice for dealing with those killed in battle or as a consequence of their injuries yeah well, well it, it, it's it's varied over time so i think i'll just pick up on a, a couple of time frames so if you look at kind of uh I suppose 1815, let's think of a, a big battle. 1815, the Battle of Waterloo. What happened at the end of the Battle of Waterloo? Well, <laughs> fairly gruesome, really, I suppose, is, is people were basically put into, into big burial pits. Uh, there was an element of sorting out the enemy from uh, uh, from the... Uh, uh, from our side so on our side it's obviously it's the the, the, the British or the English so uh, well no British a lot of Scots regiments there so burial pits were dug uh, and and bodies were put into those um, the French as the uh, as the vanquished didn't have that opportunity so in some cases their bodies were burnt so they, they had, had great big burial uh, fires or fires should I say uh, so yeah so we didn't really care for the dead in that way it was more a case of uh, of disease of trying to stop disease and that was the major consideration at that period so let's m- move forward again i'm just going to tell you one, one other thing this is a matter of interest i'm from east yorkshire and after the battle of waterloo one enterprising chap went across to the uh, to the site and he saw all the bones on the surface still i mean there were literally piles of bones everywhere and he thought I know that minute. I can see a business opportunity here. If I, I have to say, most of these bones are horse bones rather than human remains by then. But again, so many horse bones everywhere. He, in fact, gathered them all up, had them shipped across to East Yorkshire. They went into crushing mills then to be crushed and turned into fertilizer and went onto the fields of East Yorkshire. So the fields of East Yorkshire were fertilized by the bones from the Battle of Waterloo. Just extraordinary. Anyway, and another thing they did as well, this one's even more gruesome, is they became something called Waterloo teeth. Uh, because a lot of the uh, the bodies had the teeth pulled out. I'm going off on one of my famous tangents here from what we're supposed to be talking about. No, no, it's uh, no, no, no. It's but a lot of a lot of the teeth were pulled out, and then they were made into dentures for people that had lost their teeth, and there was a great need. And so they became known as Waterloo teeth. These teeth made from uh, from uh, the dead of the Battle of Waterloo. Anyway, so that's looking at Waterloo. If we if we go forward to the 1850s and let's think of the Crimean War. Then again, again, mass graves created after the, the battles, but people 
we're allowed to to build and purchase uh, uh, um, uh, little memorial sites for their lost ones. So we're starting to get a, 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 the more memorialization of the graves. So we're getting markers to mark where men uh, men were, and also larger memorials to mark where the burial uh, pits were. But let's move on to the to the Boer War, almost turn of the of the last century. So uh, uh, 1890s, uh, 1900, uh, and there we get uh, an attempt to record who is being buried properly. So the Royal Engineers were tasked to uh, to record and to, to bury the dead. There's an element of money always in this, and the, the military, the army, were not keen on paying people to, to do all of this. They didn't want to waste money, so so very often it was the local people that got involved in the, in the burial of the dead. And here, again, uh, who was going to look after the graves? When they were finished, if the Royal Engineers are recording and, and, and burying some them who is then going to look after the graves because there's no money put aside and in this case there was something called uh, the guild of loyal women and they they formed in uh, south africa and they cared for the the graves so you can see there's this gradual development of of people becoming interested in knowing exactly where the soldiers are buried and then who's going to care for the graves uh, after they've been buried so Pete, how did World War I revolutionise the burial of the war dead? And was it due to pressure from the public that something had to be done in, in order to honour these men? Or was it something else? I think the first thing you have to think of is, is the army and how the army is formed. Prior to the First World War, the army, for, for, most of the time, was a professional army. So you, uh, you volunteered to serve in it, and that was seen as, you know, that's you volunteering, so you know what's going to happen if you're killed, then you're probably going to be left somewhere on, on the, uh, around the empire. Uh, but of course, now we have, with the First World War, we have uh, uh, an awful lot of volunteers, not just the volunteers for the regular army, but the people volunteering just for the First World War. And then we have the conscripts as well. And it was felt that with all of these people now volunteering, uh, that there had to be a, a better system of caring for them if they were killed and when they were killed, because it became very obvious, uh, the First World War very often referred to as the first uh, war of technology. And so it became obvious with the very heavy casualties that something had to be done. Uh, and even more so that something had to be done to record where soldiers were, were being buried and who they were. Because before it was just left to the regiments to do it. So individual regiments would record their own dead. And it was felt that this wasn't really this, this massive army that's coming into, into play. How are they going to do that? Who is going to do that? And so it, there had to be a seed change of, of what was going to uh, what was going to happen and who was going to record and and who was going to care for the dead and all of these decisions had to be made very quickly because certainly right at the start of the war they hadn't been thought through. So can you tell us who Fabian Ware was and about his role in changing how the war dead were buried and remembered? Yeah, well Fabian Ware is a, a really interesting uh, character. I mean, there are books about him. Um, previously, he was the, the editor of the Morning Post, which was a, a right-wing, uh, sometimes grab an imperialist uh, newspaper. Uh, and he'd, he'd been retired for about four years, or certainly not exactly retired, but he, he, he certainly wasn't the editor any longer. And um, But he was a very keen driver, and uh, he was in the RSC, the Royal Automobile Club. And again, one of these oddities, right at the start of the war, there was a need for cars and vehicles and drivers because the British Army just didn't have enough. And so they asked for the Royal Automobile Club, would they be interested in, in helping out? And of course, they said yes. And so they dispatched a lot of uh, their members, uh, and Fabian Ware being one of them, across to France to help with their vehicles. And, and they did all sorts of jobs. They became messenger carriers. They were intended to look for people that were uh, trapped that had been abandoned as the army withdrew but of course they couldn't get through the german lines so that became a, a, an issue straight away as the lines solidify what do you do with these these guys whistling about in vehicles so one of the things that they thought would be a good idea was to to convert some of them into mobile red cross units use those vehicles and the drivers uh, and basically Fabian Ware commanded one of these uh, mobile uh, units for the uh, for the Red Cross, um, and that's how basically how he how he got there originally. That's how he became involved. 
And of course, that leads to if he's if he, he's commanding a Red Cross unit, they have people that are dying at their at their sites, and he starts organising the burials. And then he realises that there are guys buried here and there, all over in little graves, especially in this period of movement. And he he starts recording where they're being buried, and in fact, uh, also moving them and gathering them up and bringing them into 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 cemeteries. So that's how he became involved in the creation of the very early cemeteries. So, Pete, before the Imperial War Graves Commission, was there actually was it was the grave registration unit, wasn't it? That was that was how graves re, uh, that was how people were recorded if they'd been killed in battle. Is that is that right? Yeah, well, the, the, the GIU grave registration units uh, were the people that are going to uh, bury them and record them, but they're doing it on behalf of something called the G, D, G, R, and E, which is the Directorate of Graves Registration and Inquiry. And basically, they are the people, they were formed, uh, and again, this is where Ware uh, uh, basically takes charge of this, uh, of this group, of this, this uh, I don't know what to describe it, this directorate, and, um, and he's, he's going to be basically the one that's heading this up, and this is going to do the bigger thing. This is where they really are starting to think about the bigger picture. What are we going to do? What, what are we going to do as the war develops, a war of movement? Who is recording these people? Well, we are. We're going to do it now, and we're going to also start discussions. One of the things, that, of course, is the media. We can't start burying people left, right, and centre in in a foreign country in France. What are the French going to say about all of this? So that's one of the other things that had to happen. Those discussions with the French uh, about uh, about burying uh, burying people. And I'll just read you something. It was a little. Uh, uh, this is in on the 29th of December in 1915. Um, it was decided that the French would give land in perpetuity for the burial of, of, of the Allied dead. Um, and so that, again, had to, had to happen. It's something we see on all of the Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries today, land given in perpetuity. It says it on every single cemetery, uh, and that's, uh, uh, that, that means that they've got a permanent resting place. So a little bit of forward thinking, Pete, by Fabian Ware, and, and once he'd started to set this up, who did he report to with, with these dead? Did he report to General Haig with, with all these findings and obviously starting to bury these men who, who died on the battlefield? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, so, uh, I mean, this goes right to the, the top levels, and so uh, even uh, as the uh, Commonwealth War Graves, as we now know it, but the Imperial War Graves was formed, then it, uh, yeah, it, be, it, uh, it, it uh, immediately attracts people. Rudyard, Kip, uh, Rudyard Kipling is going to be in, uh, involved. The Prince of Wales is going to be involved. But I'm just going to again read something that had, uh, I scribbled down a, a few uh, notes here. And, and this is actually uh, Douglas Haig. And it's something, you know, he, he's commanding the forces in the field. And we think, would he be involved? Would he? And yes, he was. He, he was very interested, in fact. Uh, I'm just going to read something that he, he wrote. It is fully recognised that the work of this organisation, he's talking about the DGR and E. It's a right mouthful, that abbreviation. Um, uh, it is fully recognised that the work of this organisation is of uh, a purely sentimental value uh, and that it does not directly contribute to the successful termination of the war. So he's, he's basically saying uh, that it's not doing anything for the war, but he goes on to say, it has, however, an extraordinary mor moral value to the troops in the field as well as the relatives and friends of the dead at home. The mere fact that these officers, and this is officers of the DGR and E, um, visit day after day the cemeteries close behind the trenches, fully exposed to shell and rifle fire, accurately to record not only the names of the dead, but also the exact place of burial, uh, has a symbolic value to the men that it would be difficult to exaggerate. So he's realised, uh, even the king has realised that, yeah, it's not important in the overall what's going on in the big picture of the war, but the relatives um, ha are becoming more and more, I suppose, uh, um, worried about what is happening to their their relatives who are being killed. Who is looking after the graves? Um, and um, and so things start. Other things start to to happen. So one of the things to show that we are looking after the graves, we we actually put photographers out. There are photographic teams working for the DGRNE, taking pictures of the uh, of the graves to send to the relatives, and they were all offered the opportunity to have one. Uh, photograph for free and then subsequent ones you had to actually pay for 
but that's doing two things. It's showing to to those people who are worried about their, their relatives' graves that they're being looked after, and uh, and here's a picture of it, so you can see exactly what it what it looks like. So you mentioned the Prince of Wales, and you mentioned Rudyard Kipling. Can you tell us who they are and, and what their role was in getting the Imperial War Graves Commission up and running? Yeah. Um, well, the Prince of Wales, he became the first president uh, of the Imperial War Graves Commission. So he's he's a figurehead. I have to say more than anything else, he's a figurehead. And the Prince of Wales was uh, was very interested in the war full stop. He wanted to be across actually fighting. And he was told that basically, no, we, we can't afford to lose you. So you're not going. But uh, that was the next best thing was to to head up um, the Imperial War Graves uh, Commission. Uh, Rudyard Kipling was also very, uh, very interested he's also uh, an imperialist uh, sometimes seen as the greatest imperialist uh, and so he would have uh, have known Fabian Ware very well uh, they would have uh, almost certainly been friends and so Rudyard uh, uh, Kipling becomes involved because of the loss of his son uh, his son had been killed during the Battle of Luz and sadly will become one of the missing uh, himself there's a lot of debate whether he's still missing or not I'm not going to go into that whole story uh, today or we'll be here for forever but but because of the loss of his son um, uh, he uh, he was kind of you have to say there's an element of atonement here returning for the loss of his son because he went and pulled strings to make sure that his son got into the military because he had very bad eyesight um, and so uh, so he he became very much involved with the Commonwealth War Graves. Uh, he also wrote the history of the Irish Guards, which his, uh, his son was serving in the Irish Guards. BBC did a very good drama a few years ago uh, called, uh, what is it called? My Dear Son Jack, I think, or something like that. Uh, it's a, uh, I forget the words exactly, but that, see if you can track it down. It's very good. It stars uh, Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter. He, he plays uh, Kipling's son. Yes, I've I've seen that. I think it's my boy Jack. I think it I think is the title. Yeah, that's that, the one. That's the, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> it's a yeah, it's a very it's a very good documentary. And yeah, it's it's one of those ones, Pete, that you in the. I mean, it's a little off, a little tantric here, but it's a very interesting because when you see that, you see how Rudyard he. When he knows that Jack's missing and the lengths he goes to to try and find him in the movie, it's ve- and it's like a maybe he feels that you know a bit of guilt for for actually pushing to yeah. get his son in. Yeah. yeah, and I think that it's a great example of some of the fathers who you know let their sons go to war, oh, no, and definitely. when they did go missing yeah, or they were killed, they did feel a sense of guilt, and and it was felt felt across the board. You only have to, to I mean, the, the water diviner uh, is another example. It, it it starts off with a really good kind of nice little story and turns into something completely different uh, as a bit of a blockbuster or the attempt to make it into a blockbuster. But I thought the original concept of the water diviner, again, a man trying to find what's happened to his uh, his sons on the Gallipoli Peninsula and a, a great concept. And, and what they would, what they're doing, what those two films we've just been discussing are, are doing really is showing what, uh, in a way, what, uh, the feeling of, of the greater public who had lost th- their relatives. What is happening with our relatives' graves? Uh, uh, why are, why can we not bring them back? I know it's something that we'll, we'll touch upon in a minute, uh, but why can we not bring them back? Well, you know, who is looking after them? Are they being looked after? What will happen after the war? Can I go and visit them? Now, all of, the, all of those questions are, are worrying relatives, and you can see very often in letters and documents, both official and non-official, that uh, people are concerned about what, what is happening with their relatives' graves. So, Pete, once the commission was established, what were the first considerations facing its enormous tasks of burying the war dead? Well, that, well, first of all, uh, let's just do the date. So they were formed in May 1917. So, so the um, Imperial War Graves Commission is formed during the war. But, but their role was most definitely not and still is not in burying the dead. And it, and it does get very confusing because it, it's, that's what we feel that they, that they do, that they, that they are the, the people. But strictly speaking, during the war, it was the the military that buried the dead, and later on, it will, funny enough, it will be it will be the French that that are recovering and uh, and uh, organising the burial of our dead. The, the Imperial War Graves Commission, their job is to ensure that everything runs smoothly, that they all get the headstone, that they're put into suitable uh, suitable cemeteries. 
um, and to organise those cemeteries to to take their to take their uh, their bodies. But it was something very much. I think it's about money again. That the imperial war graves, the remit, the way they were set up was just to to do that to organise the record keeping, to organise the cemeteries and the building of cemeteries, but not the physical looking for. Uh, or, or, or exhuming of the dead in the in, in those uh, those early days. So it's um, so yes, it's it's something that there's a lot of people are surprised about. Even today, they they imagine that the Commonwealth War Graves are those people that are that are organising everything, but it's not. It it isn't. They are the keepers of the of the detail and the keepers keepers of the records and the keepers of the cemeteries and and ensuring that once they've been buried, that they are looked after in perpetuity for forever. So Pete, why did the commission? refused to repatriate the dead and why did they not let the dead go back to their families in England or obviously Australia was too far and but England yeah. England wasn't far so why did the why did they flat out refuse to repatriate the, the war dead yeah uh, I mean my sometimes you just my instant view is you know you think about it and you think why wouldn't they do that and the first thing that that in, in, kind of instantly comes into my mind is morale Never mind the, the practicalities of doing it. Just imagine trains, loads of coffins, and that's what it would be, coming in from the coast every day, in the day in, day out, from the battlefields uh, of France, coming across the Channel uh, and, and being brought into cemeteries in Britain. It would be the most demoralising thing for the country to physically see all of these graves. Now, I can hear people thinking, well, that might have stopped the war. Well, yes, it might, if they could physically see all of these bodies coming in, but... But that's not going to happen. Uh, and the second thing is logistics of it. To literally to organise that when everything is being geared up for us to try and beat the Germans, to get men across, to get food across. Now, we have millions of men on the front line and just trying to keep everything running smoothly was not just an enormous effort. And if you imagine everybody's going backwards and forwards and then you'd have coffins coming in amongst everything, and especially ships and trains and it would just be very, very difficult and very, very demoralising for everybody involved. So it was felt that the the best thing they could do would be to organise cemeteries in France. And once they got that permission from the French to organise that, to have permanent cemeteries in French for uh, for the war dead. What I ought to say is that right at the start, because right at the start of the war, that decision had not been made. And I think the estimate is about 45 bodies were exhumed by wealthy people who could afford to get people, grave diggers and people to uh, uh, to move the bodies and bring them back to England. But 45 were repatriated to the UK before the rules came in and said, whoa, stop. Because that's the second thing, I suppose. If the government couldn't pay for that and wasn't willing to pay for it, then it would be left to families to pay. And of course, that would then make it that the wealthy could afford to bring their sons back and the poor could not. And one of the of the great levelers of the imperial war graves was that in death we would all be the same so it didn't matter whether you were a brigadier or a, or in theory a black south african laborer you would have the same headstone and be be cared for in the same way in the cemeteries now that's not going to happen totally correctly but that was the theory uh, or roughly the theory i'm probably overcooking it a little bit there no no i, th- I think it's good pete to uh, so look some sometimes you you have to have a bit of imagination of how it would have been back in those times and you know it's one of those things that i think it's good in a podcast that you can you can sometimes just just assume what might have happened so <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so Pete, well, I, I read a quote, I, I read somewhere that I think what, what you were touching on with the how morale would be with coffins going back home. And I think I read somewhere that the normal wastage on the battlefield, just without attack, just, just holding the line was roughly 5,000 casualties or, or uh, killed a day, which, which you, you, when you think about that, Pete, that's, that's, that's a lot and it springs to my mind that... Geez, that's you're right. That's a lot of coffins going back across the channel. Yeah, there's also issues, and uh, w- w- for example, the Americans uh, did uh, repatriate some of their war dead. Uh, and, uh, again, these decisions were supposed to be have been made uh, right uh, during the war in discussions. And one of the things that the French, the French also agreed to this that that the war dead would remain where they fell. Now the French didn't keep that agreement either. They decided to start moving their bodies back home, so uh, families could uh, could 
go and retrieve their bodies and have their relatives uh, taken home. Americans decided that they would also have some of their relatives uh, taken home as well. But again, it was a case you had to pay for it. Now, of course, this is this is one of the issues is the bodies were not in very good states and uh, and the coffins were not sealed properly. You, know, you couldn't have a sealed coffin as we get as we have nowadays. And, you know, a journey across the Atlantic uh, with, with these semi sealed coffins and bodies not properly embalmed, if embalmed at all, of course, some of them could, just could not be embalmed. I mean, it's one of those issues, isn't it? You know, the, if you don't understand the what what modern warfare does to a human body, you realize it's very difficult to embalm anything because the body may not be intact. We won't go into too many gory details, but but it, it, there were just lots of issues. And so that went all horribly wrong for the Americans in, in their shipping of their bodies across uh, across the Atlantic as well. So it, it just is it, it just isn't practical. And also, also for health reasons, again, going back to uh, the wars we discussed earlier, uh, where bodies were buried for health reasons, well, it was no different on the First World War. They, they had to get the bodies underground fairly, fairly quickly. What was the public's response to not being able to bring their loved ones home? Many and varied, as you'd expect, I suppose. That there were there were various um, uh, campaigns uh, and people that felt, you know, including including some of the wealthy families, some of the, the great and good, felt that this wasn't the, the 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 right thing. That bodies ought to be ought to be, you know families ought to have that opportunity. And I can honestly say, from a, a personal point of view, as a as a, a father. Of, of multiple sons that yes yes if anything was to happen to mine i think i'd you know, at, at the very least like to know where they were and to have them as close as as i could and you know i'm not quite sure how i would react uh, in, in, if i had that option if if it was the first world war how, how would i feel about it during the first world war and I, i'm not quite sure really how i would feel about it but I, but I can certainly understand how families and certainly families who were wealthy and could afford to have the, their sons brought home, why couldn't they? Why couldn't they overrule the government? Uh, and, I, and I've read just recently in, in preparation for this, this podcast uh, some of the letters and things from families saying exactly that. Why can I not bring my son home? You took him off to war. and Why are you not allowing me to bring him back, even if you will not bring him back yourself? You know? And so... Yeah, I can un- I can understand, but it it was felt that it would be the money that would be able to get them back if they started bringing them back after the war. Also, I just know from from uh, from what the re- research I've done over the years that the Commonwealth war graves we like to think that that they are exactly what they look like. Their bodies are directly beneath every headstone, but but in reality, we know it's not always quite like that. And I think the other thing that would worry people would be. The body that came back, is it going to be the body that it's supposed to be? And we know that mistakes were made and, and, and uh, during the war and after the war. So that would also be a, a worry to me that, you know, that isn't it not best to leave them here with their pals? And I have to say that became the view as some of these families came across later on when the cemeteries have been created and, and looking something like they do now. They're very beautiful, the flowers and you know, this whole concept of looking like an English uh, uh, garden within the cemeteries, then the, when the families did visit in the 1930s, when things had been established, um, and I think a lot of them then changed their minds and said, no, this is where they need to be. They need to be here with their mates. They need to be here you know, uh, with all their pals that they fought and died with. So, so I think people changed. As time went on, people felt that perhaps this had been the right thing to do to leave them on the battlefields. So, Pete, you mentioned the headstones and you talk about how they came about. When you walk these cemeteries, Pete, and you've done it many times and I've, I've been lucky enough and fortunate enough to do it as well, and what strikes me is the personal inscriptions. Can, can you tell us about how these personal inscriptions came about and also what the different types of headstones there are? Yeah, well, again, lots and lots of debates right the way from the creation of the uh, the, the imperial war graves as to uh, what the cemeteries should look like, um, and a way of obviously trying to get get the head around that is to is to discuss it with people. So they went and uh, got some of the great and good of the architectural world. Uh, well, so Edward uh, Edward Lutyens, Herbert Baker, Reginald Blomfield, three very very different characters didn't ever get on particularly with each, with each other but they are going to be the three main architects of the of the cemeteries um and those architects and then the others that are involved including uh, as we've already 
uh, already mentioned, Rudyard Kipling and uh, uh, Ware himself and, and many, many others. And they put forward their ideas of what the cemetery should, should look like. And they started off by looking at having a Christian cross for everybody. But of course, that's, that's one of the issues. Not everybody was a Christian. And so it was felt that perhaps they ought to look at headstones um, because uh, they could then mark them with, uh, as, they, as they do, uh, the Star of David for the Jewish soldiers, a Christian cross for all denominations of, uh, of Christian faith. And then there are headstones for, for Muslims. There are also headstones with nothing on for, the, for non-believers. So they covered as many things as they, as they could. And the best way of doing that is to have a headstone rather than, uh, than a Christian cross. So that's why we go down the headstone. But again, there was a lot of people, a lot of debates about that in newspapers. People saying, no, no, that's not right. It should be a cross. And, uh, but the final thing was that how about that we give people an opportunity to put an epitaph on the headstones. And so that only works if you have a headstone. And as you see, the beautiful straight rows of the, uh, in the American cemeteries of both world wars, beautiful crosses white marble crosses but no nowhere to put any kind of proud inscription on there and so it was just felt to be a good thing to do to give people that opportunity now it's it's not quite as magnanimous as uh, as as it sounds because um they they had to pay three and a half pence a, a letter for the inscriptions and that leads to uh, to variations, the Canadians means tested it. Uh, New Zealand banned it. They felt it uh, it wasn't the right thing to do because the poor couldn't uh, afford it. Uh, the British uh, paid. Um, Australians, they appear to have started paying, but then that was almost forgotten. And they, I, I used to say that Australians paid, but I'm not sure they do. Uh, I've been reading some of the some of the records recently, and I can see that's, that that they're not paying. Uh, but the British, generally speaking, paid that three and a half pence uh, a letter. A letter. Um, so you get some absolutely phenomenal inscriptions and uh, don't ask me adam for any inscriptions nothing nothing comes to mind at the moment but there are some there are some great ones and they're very moving and there are several good books i have to say on uh, on on monumental inscriptions uh, uh, on the uh, on the battlefields of the first world war so uh, yeah very moving and it gives you an insight into loss of memory and that's what i like about it uh, and you do you have to swallow very hard sometimes when you read some of the inscriptions especially I don't like the ones where it's children. It talks about their children and being missed and, and daddy. And uh, I found that very, very heartbreaking almost. So, so yeah, but they are, it's well worth going to the cemeteries and just having a wander up and down and reading the private inscriptions. Having said that, we can actually see them on the Commonwealth War Graves website now. Uh, they didn't used to, but they now uh, show you the inscriptions on if the if they if the families have had a private inscription put on there, you can now see what they have uh, had uh, put onto those headstones in the records of the Commonwealth War Graves, all available online. It's when you talk about the headstones, Pete, and and the personal inscriptions. When you when you read them, you're right. You Sometimes you you do have to walk away and and just take a moment because they you know you, you read only only son of Mr and Mrs Smith of Ballarat and and it, it it's you know the the inscriptions are they're truly they're, they're very moving and and I I, yeah. I sort of when you when you go to I, I it's a shame that the New Zealanders banned it because I often find Pete that you well for me personally when I've been over there I feel attached when you read those personal inscriptions like I, I feel a I feel a sense of uh, that you get attached yeah. to that that grave and you you sort of imagine the story of of you know what what that soldier, you know, what his family was like, and and I feel that, New Z like the New Zealanders, you you can't you can't do that because like you can. I agree entirely. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree entirely. You're, you're absolutely right, uh, and it, it is it, it is a window into those families, and especially for Australian ones, if you find an interesting inscription that, that maybe says something and that you maybe don't understand, and you think, oh, I wonder what that means, or why did they write that. But of course, with the Australian uh, uh, service records existing, you can very quickly go online and see if you can get any insight into why perhaps they wrote. Uh, sometimes you can't; you, there's no no clue at all. But but other times you can see exactly why they why they wrote what they what they did. And so it is; it's a little window into loss of memory, um, which which is very moving. Absolutely, and and we should mention Pete that. So some had the Star of David, some had a, a Catholic cross. But if 
If the soldier won a Victoria Cross, was that put on the headstone? Yeah, it was. Yep. Uh, any award goes onto the headstone. So uh, under the, the soldier's um, uh, his name, rank, uh, uh, number, all of the things that you'd expect to see, date of death. Uh, but any military awards, you know, military medal, military cross, uh, DSO, what, whatever it may be, that is also on the headstone. But uh, unusually, the only other, I suppose, pictogram that you get, the only other picture that you get on, on there is the actual Victoria Cross. So instead of having a religious uh, symbol, they remove that. There's not space for that. And, and for those that were awarded the Victoria Cross, they, uh, they get literally um, uh, the Victoria Cross engraved into the, into the headstone. So, uh, yeah, so it makes them very, very obvious. A little bit like uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor for the Americans in their cemeteries, that, that is indicated on, on the, uh, the uh, serviceman's headstone, uh, and that's done in gold. So, you can you, again, you can see uh, those, they stand out in the American cemeteries. So, it was just a way of making sure that you didn't miss them, I suppose, uh, 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 and for very good reason. You know, it's the highest uh, award that you can be, uh, be given in the, uh, in the forces in the Empire's forces of, the, of that time. And so, so, yeah, it was important that they should stand out. Absolutely. And initially, Pete, how were the war dead buried and where? And can you share with us, it's a good time to bring this in, what type of battle cemeteries existed at the end of the war? And, and can you tell us the different types of cemeteries that exist now? Yeah, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so where do I start? Um, so let's just think about what went on uh, during during the war. So soldiers dead, he falls down on the battlefield. If his body can be recovered, it's not going to be moved very far if he's if he's dead. He's almost certainly going to be buried in the nearest small cemetery. Uh, but in a lot of cases, he will be buried where he fell, and he will be recovered later on. So individual burials or small groupings of men. Now all of those are generally speaking known as battlefield burials. Now, what we don't think about much is this went on during the war as well. But if we were successful, very often we cleared the battlefield and we sorted out the dead at that time. Um, sadly, for the fighting to go over those battlefields again uh, and uh, intermingling and causing problems. So it was it was an ongoing issue uh, that, that uh, happened during the war where men were gathered together and then lost again and then eventually recovered at, at the end of the war. Um, so battlefield cemeteries, uh, of course, guys are dying of their wounds so we have medical cemeteries and so those cemeteries tend to follow the medical trails so there'll be a, a, a clearing station a dressing station um, a, a field uh, ambulance a field hospital a stationary hospital uh, on the coast men are dying in all of those locations and sadly of course they're dying back in the in the uk as well uh, well in the uk they were buried in there in the cemeteries very close to the uh, to the hospital or they, they can be once you're in England then you can be sent home to your relatives uh, your body can be moved if you manage to get back to England uh, wounded and then die there uh, but so there are enormous cemeteries on the on the coast uh, that uh, contain the, the graves uh, of men who died under medical care and then the final one is after the war then what are we going to do with all these tiny cemeteries that are all uh, all over the place? These one or two bodies, and a decision was made uh, that um, the men should be. Now I'm forgetting the number now. It shows I haven't done this for a while. A while. It's either thirty or forty. I forget. Ah, uh, forty. I think it is, Pete. Thank you, Adam. I knew that. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So for, for less than forty, the cemeteries had to be shut down and uh, so uh, so they couldn't remain and so they're going to be gathered together and they'll be moved into what become known as concentration cemeteries now of course you can have all three in one cemetery as we very often do it starts as a small battlefield cemetery but because the fighting was there the fighting moves off the area becomes a medical area you get people buried in the same cemetery that are dying of wounds and then after the, at the end of the war it's made into a concentration cemetery we get a concentration of graves in there as well and and so we get cemeteries that are all three as well a good example pete of how two exist side by side is at polygon wood you've got the little cemetery where my, my little friend the donkey on on one side you've got a battlefield cemetery and then on the other side you've yeah Tomek, 
<laughs> Tomek. Yeah. Yeah. Tomek. And, and, and he always, every yeah, time you turn up, yeah. Pete, he is always, he is always having a nice old, he, he always likes to, Eeyore, Eeyore, yeah, always. Yeah, so, Eeyore. But that's a, that's a good example of um, a battlefield does, cemetery yeah. on one side and a concentration cemetery over the other side. And also, I mentioned Polygon Wood because Polygon Wood's got the 5th Australian yeah. Division Memorial there as well. So it's a really, you, you actually get to see a lot of things in that little small space. I can do a talk that goes on for about three hours there if I want to, uh, because of that, because of that very reason. You've got the battlefield cemetery, as you've just said. You've got a concentration cemetery. You've got a, a divisional memorial, and you've also got a memorial to the missing, because a New Zealand memorial to the missing there as well. So yeah, it's a fantastic place to go to to get an overview of uh, of the cemeteries of the Great War. Thank you for clearing up for people who weren't aware what the, what the different types of cemeteries there were in existence. So many men, many men's yeah. families were told that their loved ones uh, were either lost or missing. Is that the same thing, or do these terms refer to different situations? It's a very good question, and I don't think unless it's a rhetorical question, you know the answer, so you may be correcting me here, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, because missing uh, is obviously is, is the one that we hear the most of, uh, and that's what the, the relatives were eventually would be told, that your relative is missing. Would they be told they're lost? No, they wouldn't. So uh, missing is the term that you'll see on the official document uh, documentation, and eventually they will just be given the information that, uh, uh, that they are... Yeah, would they be then told that they're lost in the end? I don't think they were. I don't remember seeing the term lost on documentation. It's it's just missing. And then eventually they will be told what memorial that their relative is going to be commemorated on. Unless you know something else, Adam, I'm going to hand it back to you, that one. <laughs> no, because, Pete, when I first came over and, and met you in 2015, when I first walked the battlefield, when missing, I, I thought myself, I thought, are they, you know, have they just yeah. been blown away like to total smithereens and, and do we not know yeah. where they are or and but what I after doing some research, we know that each man who is missing is recorded a on a yeah. you know, it's it's a memorial to the missing. You've you've got the Menning Gate in, in Belgium yeah. in Ypres, you've got Tynecott Cemetery, you've got as you mentioned, Polygon Wood, and then you've got yeah. Tiep Vow to the British missing on the Somme. And we, Pete, after doing research, we know now that these men, they're not missing. They're, they just can't identify a lot of these men. So when, when it's got a headstone of, unknown, uh, uh, you know, only known to God, I'll let you talk, Pete. I'll let you go. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I know what you're getting at now. I told, I've realised what you're getting at. Yes. So I know what you mean. So uh, is a missing man lost in a way? Um, and in some cases, yes, he is. Because you're right, there is a, and nobody's ever worked out the percentage because it wouldn't really work. But there are, you know, how many of the missing are literally missing, or have they just lost their identity because they are in a cemetery as a soldier known unto God? So an unknown soldier in a cemetery. So you're absolutely right. Um, there is a, a large number of the missing are actually, uh, it's their identities that are missing. They're buried in the cemeteries as an unknown soldier. But there are equally uh, men who are lost on the battlefield. So they are lost on the battlefield. But the big problem is we don't know if you're missing, are you on the battlefield or are you in a cemetery? And to be truthful, uh, in some cases, we can hazard a guess because we know there are, there are groups of men from certain regiments who were found in certain areas um, and, so, and then moved into a cemetery. And so you can say these guys almost certainly came from the so-and-so battalion because that's where they were exhumed from. And again, we're getting help with that because the, uh, the Commonwealth War Graves are releasing information that gives uh, exhumation locations for some of the men that were recovered. Um, and so uh, if you know where they, where they were found, then you can hazard a guess as to, uh, as to who they may be. So there's a lot of work being done on that, and we can take that a lot further. There's Australia at the moment by documentation, by looking at all of the documents, and uh, and it's a group called uh, Fallen Diggers. Yes, correct. Is that yeah, right? that is correct. Is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, called Fallen Diggers, and uh, I think they're identifying about four a year at the moment uh, who are being identified from documentation because one of the things that the Commonwealth War Graves is obs obsessed with, quite rightly, 
is that a body cannot be exhumed once it's he's um, he or her has been buried uh, by by them. They will not allow uh, exhumation for obviously DNA to be to be taken. They won't allow that, uh, and I think that's the right thing. I think uh, yes, once they've been buried by the by, uh, by the Imperial or Commonwealth war graves, then that's it. That's that's where they remain. It's funny you mentioned that, Pete, because yeah, it's Dennis Frank and Andrew Pittaway, previous guests on on the podcast. So and it was very. I thought they'd been on your. Yeah, yeah. very Good. very interesting yeah. to. It was a very interesting podcast, and I I say to anyone who who does listen to this, go back and actually listen to that podcast because it is a it's a fascinating insight of how Dennis and and Andrew actually do go about their work and and how they do use documentation and they've actually. They're actually. I, I still talk to them, Pete. They've got a few cases at the moment that they're that they're working on, and they've got uh, strong. It, it's strong evidence that they will have a few more uh, identified later on this year. So, yeah, yeah, it's 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 very good that you mentioned fallen diggers because they do a fantastic job. Yeah, and, and of course the the the, the uh, I should mention the, the the work that has been uh, done by uh, the Commonwealth War Graves uh, uh, and. Um, on trying to identify some of those that are found on the battlefields uh, today, that that still goes on, um, and uh, I forget the other team, the joint. Com- the little, the, no, I'm not even going to attempt to remember it. But there's a no, there's, there's the military group. It's a, it's the modern MOD effectively that are involved in in the other people that try and track down uh, the uh, the relatives uh, and find the relatives of people who are identified on the battlefields. It's Pete, this like we're 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 jumping all over the place, but I feel that this podcast you can do that because it's it's such a broad topic that you can that you know it, it we can go down these little avenues. And it, you mentioned today, like I like if they if if it's a good time to bring it in, if if there is a soldier and remains found on the battlefields today, what happens, Pete? What what happens today? Well, the first thing uh, the first thing you have to do is. Uh... I need to I need to explain something really. I, I'll, I'll do that a general talk. So if if a, 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 you find remains, if I'm out walking and I found find human remains, now in the old days, if you found human remains in the in the plough lines, then there was absolutely no point in calling in the Commonwealth War Graves because that's the but well, it's not the first thing. The first thing you have to do if you find a, a complete body or nearly a complete body, you have to ring the police. So the police are the first port of call because they need to assess uh, ass, ass, assess uh, very quickly whether it's a modern uh, uh, burial or whether it's uh, hence possibly a murder or whether it's uh, a battlefield burial. Um, then it's the uh, the Commonwealth War Graves, and uh, they will then uh, um, come and uh, and assess whether they think it's worthwhile for the body to be exhumed. Because that's that's the key. If it's only fragments, then you can't really uh, exhume and have an individual grave. Because what if somebody in the same area then three years later found some more fragments? You know, and that's that's the problem. Um, that th- there was so for years and I feel guilty about this now for years when I came across human remains which obviously because of where I live uh, I live on the for those that don't know I live on the on the Somme battlefield so uh, I would just heal them in and cover them over because that's all you can do just just cover them over so they're not out in the sunlight again and um, uh, and that's all you did but the um, the Commonwealth War Graves have just created uh, a new grave, and uh, when I say just, it's in the last, I suppose, perhaps eight years. And a lot of the cemeteries now have graves that are for fragmentary remains. So, in other words, they're for um, for uh, these fragments that are found d- during archaeological work, uh, not necessarily during ploughing, because people don't very often pick them up. But if you did, and you knew there were human remains, then you could hand them into the Commonwealth War Graves and they would uh, they would then add them to these fragmentary remains and then every now and then they have a service and they bury uh, basically a, a box full of, uh, of fragments uh, of, of people. And I think that's very moving that that's now taken place. Having said that, there are still some people that think, well, what is the point if you're picking up you know, a toe or a finger or whatever and add it, then the rest of him is still in the fields. Well, shouldn't he, he still all remain in the field? So, again, there's debate about that, about these fragments of soldiers, whether they should be recovered. 
But I think it's more really aimed at when they're doing archaeological work, when builders are working and they come across some human remains, then at least uh, they can then be handed in and, uh, and we'll, we'll have a burial. So things change. Things don't remain the same. There is uh, on, on, ongoing changes. And the French, Pete, how they got around it, they created ossuaries, didn't they? They there's a there's a good yep. one there's a good one at Verdun with uh, with the you look under the floor and you see the, the bones of you know so many Frenchmen. It is just I've I've been there myself, Pete, and it is it, you you just it is unbelievable the amount of bones that are there, the fragments and the bones, and yeah, it's it it's a bit confronting at first. Like when you do see it, you you look and go whoo. And then you are not knowing and then doing research, you understand why they did what they did. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's absolutely, absolutely true. Um, and, and it is, I, I quite like that, the way that, that, that things don't, uh, uh, don't remain uh, uh, constant, that things change. And uh, I think the way that the, uh, the Commonwealth War Graves are going is, is interesting in the fact that we can now look at so much more to do with a soldier and uh, and uh, his burial in the records, so we can see we can see the sometimes the, the the basically the family what they what they want to put on the headstone. We can see their address and where they're writing from. We can look at where the uh, the information about from the recovery teams as their bodies were recovered. We get a map reference occasionally of where those bodies are recovered from. And all of that has just been recently added to the, to their uh, to their database and, and put online. So there's a, a lot more information that we can see. Also, the uh, the Commonwealth War Graves are now ad- adding information about battles, so you can actually get uh, information about about the battles that they took part in. They're also you go into the cemeteries and they will give you information on some of those buried in those cemeteries. Now. Some people don't like it. Some people think that, that, that their core job should just be caring for the dead and ensuring that they're, that they're looked after in perpetuity. But no, I think, it's, I think it's interesting that they're adding this extra information because certainly from the point of view of somebody doing research, that extra information helps immeasurably. Absolutely. And Pete, it's a good time to bring in what the exhumation teams did and, and, and how, how are people selected for this gruesome work? Um, yeah, I'm just going to go back a bit because it, it was irritating me. Joint Casualty and Compassionate Centre. I knew it had a lot of C's in it. I just been, thank God for modern technology. I've been looking it up as we were talking. So it's known as the JCCC. Uh, and they, uh, I'm going to read what it just says on, online. Uh, the, manage, the management of British Armed Forces casualties and compassionate cases 24 hours a day. So what's interesting is they deal with modern casualties in the army but they also deal with soldiers who died during the first world war i find that just fascinating that they're treated and uh, 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 and, look, and looked after by the same people that would treat and look after the relatives of a, 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 a of a modern casualty it doesn't make any difference that he died in the first world war it's still the same team that does the work so yeah. it's very interesting very interesting it is. Uh, I, so, and i'm glad you looked that up <laughs> so remember it jccc joint casualty and compassionate center yeah. there you go There's, as you said a yeah. lot of c's <laughs> yeah so <laughs> so pete we talk about the excavation teams and yeah who was tasked for this gruesome work and how were they selected well dur- during the war- during the actual war it's the grave registration units that are, are tasked to, uh, to go out there and um i don't think there was so much selection there you were just told to, that 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 was that was your 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 job and in fact it was, it's even worse than that and I, i've just been reading and in fact i'm doing a lot of research on them it's the um, for for our Australian audience, it, it, uh, I'm researching on the 5th of November, the uh, first battalion of the AIF uh, fighting here, just very close to where, where I live, but, because they were tasked um, in the uh, March of 1917 to go back onto their old battlefield uh, of the November and recover their dead. And I just found that quite interesting and marginally horrific, because... Uh, normally it was other people that recovered the dead for that very reason that did you really want to see your best mate after he'd been out in the open for three months and, uh, 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 and then uh, have to bury him 
Um, but for whatever reason, it was in this case, it was felt that that was the right thing to do, that they should go and clear their own battlefield and they should go and find and recover their own dead. Um, so, yeah, so that, that took place during the war. So that was uh, literally their mates themselves burying them. But as time went on and, uh, and immediately after the war, it was obviously it was going to be a very big effort and a, 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 an enormous effort. And so they actually... Uh, well, in this case, again, I don't, don't quite understand because it doesn't make sense to me, but there was something called the 68 Labour Company, uh, and it was tasked to be the first battlefield clearance company, and, and they volunteered for it. But I just, can't, I just can't see that a whole company of men, this is five officers and 560 men, all said, oh, yeah, I'll volunteer. Well, that sounds like a good job. I'll do that. Because it, it wasn't a good job, was it? That, that really, really was not a good job. Um, you know, recovering bodies and burying bodies and moving the bodies about. And, uh, you know, and this is in the, the January of 1919. So some of those bodies wouldn't necessarily have been in the ground. These are not going to be burns and uh, had not been in the ground very long. So it was a truly horrendous job. And I just I just find it interesting that they say that they all volunteered the whole, you know, the, 60, uh, the 68th Labour Company volunteered to do this work. Well, Maybe some of them volunteered, but I think the rest, the rest were probably press ganged into into doing it. So uh, yeah, uh, and and for that very reason, their uh, their initial work was not overly well supervised. They were not overly well briefed, uh, and they didn't overly spend a lot of time looking for uh, identifications. They just needed to move these people about and get them buried as quick as, as possible. And we know that they were not always as diligent as they should be. And in some cases, I have to say, they were they were downright fraudulent and were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. So the early days of the moving of the, uh, of the bodies uh, about after the war was difficult. Uh, and the, the other thing that's coming into play all the time, and you become very aware of it, it's money again. It's money. It's about money. Who is paying for all of this? Who is going to pay for it? And I have to say that immediately after the, the war and the creation of the cemeteries, as they're being created, there was a sudden, you have to say, shudder within the government saying, how are we going to afford all of this? You know, we are creating gardens. Wouldn't it be better if we, ju if we just kind of put gravel in there? You know, we buried the bodies, then graveled the whole thing, and we don't have to worry about it so much. You know, we, we don't have to worry about the weeds and everything. So it did become, uh, it, it became controversial for a little while. Should we be spending all this money on the dead? Shouldn't we be looking at the living and, and spending some of this money on the living? But I think uh, that the money being, you know, I think the right thing was done in the end, that it was decided that they would continue building the cemeteries. You know, the, uh, the designs had been done for many of them. A lot of them were finished at this point. So this is taking place not during the early phases. This is when we've almost finished all the cemeteries that they're now, they're now debating whether this is a good thing. Uh, but thankfully, they continued. And for anybody that comes out here onto the battlefields, You'd be amazed, uh, if you haven't been before, to look at the cemeteries. They are just so beautiful. And, uh, yeah, you can, you can just go and sit in them and have a, a coffee. I'm one of those people that thinks that there's nothing wrong in doing that. They have seats uh, there for, for people to sit down. Some people don't like it. Some people think that these are, you know, that, that these should be very, very precious, I suppose, that, that we shouldn't be doing anything other than almost have our heads bowed as we go into these cemeteries. But I'm not one of those people. I think that we should... Go and use those cemeteries. Go and go and go and walk them. Go and look at the flowers. Go and sniff the flowers. Go and go and sit in the seats. Go and have a coffee with the with the guys. And I just go up very often just to go and sit, just sit with them, just uh, have a have a think. Uh, and lots of people that live here do exactly the same. And lots of people that visit on a regular basis. So yes, when you come and visit these cemeteries, go and say hello to the chaps. It's always always a nice thing to do. I think the worst thing. I know it's probably a question you're going to ask me, Adam. One of the worst things that, that could possibly happen is that, that happen is that nobody came. Nobody nobody comes any longer to these cemeteries. And certainly in the late sixties, early seventies, that was the feeling out here. There were very few people coming any longer. Uh, massive anti-war rhetoric, uh, interest in the Second World War. The First World War had completely gone off the radar and uh, yeah, very, very few people coming out here. And 
Well, Pete, that's not the case today. Well, I mean, it is <laughs> at the moment because well, it is at the moment because of COVID. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but, but before COVID and up until the centenary, that you know, the the battle, like the they were not the cemeteries were visited very frequently throughout those leading up to the centenary of of the Great War. They were were visited, but in the last two years, not so much because of bloody COVID. So, <laughs> but. It, it's been, I have to say, it's been, it's been extraordinary because one of the things that is missing from all of the cemeteries are the, the, the poppies and the poppy crosses and the wreaths that are laid almost on a daily basis in, in, in most of the cemeteries as relatives and the interested decide they want to leave something in, in the cemeteries. And of course, there's nothing been left here now for almost two years. Uh, or very just a few things. I mean, I've been out to a few cemeteries and left a few poppy crosses and things, but in the main, there's nothing there. And it's extraordinary to see. And the other thing that's happened is that in some of the, the cemeteries that take a lot of wear because lots of people go there, some of the memorials, they are beautiful. Everything is very, very green and very, very uh, uh, lush because nobody's been walking on it. Nobody's been, <laughs> been damaging it in the, by wear and tear. And so, yeah, it's just extraordinary. One of the things that you, you, you would notice straight away, Adam, because uh, I know you've visited Hill 60 lots of times, is you'll know there's a muddy track that runs around Hill 60 that takes you to the bunker and things. Well, it's not muddy any longer. It's all lawns because there's so few people visiting. It's very extraordinary on the battlefields at the moment, I have to say. And when you mentioned it, Pete, you when you were talking about going and having a coffee with the with the chaps and sitting down and, and you know, just, just having some time, Pete, what what it is for me in going to these cemeteries, in from what what strikes me every time I've been over there is is they're silent cities and they you really do get the true scale and the true cost of of war and what like you just you see row and row of headstones and and you're right, Pete, it, it is just. It, it's just good to go and sit and and if you really wanted to Pete you could spend days or you know weeks just going around cemeteries like there's that there's the, so many cemeteries on the western front and and there there's row upon row and and what strikes me every time I go over Pete is the scale I just can't get over the scale and the cost yeah I think I think it it is extraordinary how many little stories you can see, you know, over 900 cemeteries and, and just, just exploring them. And I've done it not just for, for weeks and days, I've done it for years and years and years. I just, you know, I used to, in fact, when my parents uh, lived out here uh, with us for a short period, our weekly drive out was to go to another cemetery. <laughs> my mum even made the comment. She said, I've been reviewing our my photo archive. She said, you keep photographing me in cemeteries. Are you trying to tell me something? You know, and because, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> that we, just that's what we did. There were so many to look at and so different. And they are different in design and location. And um but yeah, the the individuals in them, and I've got on my phone. I'm forever taking photographs of of headstones and thinking, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why he's buried there, or I wonder what his story is, or I wonder why he's got that inscription. I must have about ten years backlog of research to do on interesting graves that I see on the battlefield, and and that's part of the the joy because you learn about these people and you don't forget them, and that's the key. That's the whole point, really, is you do not forget them. Um, and in, 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 in trying to research and just looking at them, then you don't. You, 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 you revisit what, what they did in their lives. You mentioned the excavation teams and also the grave digging teams. And were they working side by side? And, and I know I've read somewhere, Pete, that you sometimes bodies were transferred. So they were, they were exhumed at one part of the battlefield, but they were driven, you know, or sometimes 20 kilometers away why is that why why were they not and there's a cemetery right next door to where they were buried why why is that pete there's there's lots of things going on but the most i suppose most important was that uh, very often the uh, there are well two things there are closed cemeteries in other words they're not open nobody's ever going to be buried uh, in that in them so somebody found let's just let's just say 1925 you find a body in 1925 the cemeteries are created we can see where they are even if they're not completely finished but the nearest cemeteries you can't bury them there because 
their closed cemeteries. And what that normally means is they're not totally sure where everybody is in the cemetery. So they don't want any new holes being dug, new bodies brought in because they may disturb somebody that's already in there. So uh, So generally speaking, they tend to be concentration cemeteries. In other words, they know where everybody is because they they were created in those nice, neat rows that sometimes we, we see in the cemeteries. Not always, but in the concentrations, very often they're these nice, neat rows. But if you've got nice, neat rows, you know where everybody is. So you would expect the the body that's been exhumed, the soldier that's been exhumed, to be buried in the nearest concentration cemetery. But again, he's he's, he's not. And sometimes they had, as you as you said, Adam, they had just ridiculous distances away from where they were recovered. And for years, I just c- couldn't really understand. But it's very simple. There were very often grave diggers working in one cemetery because they may be clearing an area close by, and so they're creating graves, literally the holes for taking the the, uh, bodies, and literally if a body is recovered elsewhere, then all they would do is they would say, right, where's the nearest place where there's actually grave diggers working, or we know that that it's still open, um, and that's where they'd go to. So sometimes they do go ridiculous distances, and it's just purely the logistics of, of graves being prepared, uh, and uh, and the bodies being moved into those areas where graves are being prepared. Were there any differences between the the different nations? Because obviously this was a, this was a a world war, so there was many nations involved in the fighting. And was so for the different nations away from the Commonwealth. Did they when they buried their dead? Was there any difference in the way they buried their dead to the Commonwealth soldiers? Um. Well, let's talk about the German dead uh, just just briefly. The, the German dead were obviously, they created cemeteries exactly the same as ours. So behind their lines, they were creating uh, beautiful cemeteries. One in, th- in my village, the village that I'm talking to you from now, then beside the church, there was a beautiful German, uh, German cemetery. I've got a couple of photos of it. A mixture of wooden crosses, stone memorials or stone headstones and even some marble and bronze headstones and those would have been shipped from Germany by their families uh, or sometimes even their comrades onto the onto their graves. Well, well, they're all gone because the Germans were concentrated into a number of cemeteries. If they were concentrated, I think there's some doubt uh, that that all of them were concentrated, but they were concentrated into larger uh, cemeteries. And the final form that we see those in today are from the 1950s, when they were basically um, given a final uh, overhaul from their wooden crosses. They now have uh, aluminium crosses, black aluminium, painted black uh, headstones. Sometimes some of them have small headstones. So there are a variety of different uh, different designs of their markers, but basically uh, that's all from the 1950s. So they were all gathered together. So we, there are very few German cemeteries, considering there were hundreds, probably as many uh, German cemeteries behind the lines as, as there were British cemeteries behind our lines. So uh, very, very different. And of course, that's because they, they did, you know, they, they were not, uh, uh, they're the losers of the war. They're not going to be successful. And, uh, uh, and to the victors go the spoils. And so we built our nice cemeteries and their, their cemeteries. Some people think they're not particularly nice, the German cemeteries, especially the, the big one at Langemark. I, I like them. Uh, they've always got lots of trees. And if you like trees, then German cemeteries, they're a place to be. They're a little darker because of that reason. And the lawns are a little bit less um, cared for, so a little bit longer. But again, that's deliberate. They are, actually, the, the lawns are longer. But um, yeah, I, I like German, uh, German cemeteries, just not enough of them. I wish there were more because I think that would be a good juxtaposition if we could see a, you know, a British or a Commonwealth cemetery and alongside of it, uh, a German cemetery. Having said that, and I haven't mentioned this, but in a lot of the Commonwealth War Grave cemeteries, there are Germans within the Commonwealth War Grave cemeteries. And that's because if they were gathered together at the time and buried together, then they still lie together in a lot of them. In certain cemeteries, there it's almost 50-50 because... It may have started as a German cemetery and then we buried our dead there and then the Germans retook it and buried their dead there again. And so we we sometimes get a a real a real mix of of both uh, German and Empire soldiers. Um, so, so again, it's one of those nice, nice things to have a look around. You can also find French uh, within our cemeteries sometimes, but again, the French tended to concentrate, and so they have bigger and uh, almost national cemeteries, very big cemeteries. 
Um, and the Americans, again, as we know, I've already mentioned, uh, some of them went home and some of them went into big concentration cemeteries. So we have a place called Boney or Bonnie, never quite sure we pronounce it. Uh, we have um, we have an American cemetery here. It's uh, in the Aisne, just outside of the Somme department. And that's the biggest uh, American cemetery in the area. So, Pete, we, we should briefly mention, so people who don't know, so what was the process if the exhumation teams, there was no marker, there was no identity, what happened to those soldiers that had no identity? How were they commemorated? Well, again, they they had to look at what they were going to do because they were going to build, there was always this thought process that everybody had to be commemorated. And, and if anything, they, they felt that those that... Um, uh, are unknown, they don't know where they are, that those relatives should be given something that, that was fairly spectacular to commemorate their relatives on. So an unknown soldier, even though we don't know who he is, is going to be buried in the cemetery, first of all, as an unknown soldier, but his name will be on the nearest memorial to the missing. So what dictates how those memorials were created? Well, sometimes it's... it's, it's um, locked by time so it's a certain time sometimes it's a location so it's locked geographically sometimes it's both it's geographic and location but they would decide uh, that the soldiers that died during this battle or this time scale or this area will be commemorated on this memorial and, and their names will go on there um, and so it meant that and those memorials were and there were a lot of them there's far more than what we what we uh, what we normally see or talk about because that tends to be as adam has already mentioned time cut uh, the uh, um, memorial to the missing there the men in gate and teepval those are the three that everybody uh, thinks about but there are other a lot of others um, but they're all beautiful and fairly spectacular so that the whole idea was we i suppose this was what they would say to the relative we may not know where your your son or your husband's body is but look where we've put his name look what we've put his name onto and so those families would have that feeling of oh well yes we've got somewhere where we can go to commemorate him uh, that he's worthwhile and that was the, the whole the whole policy interestingly the, the french became quite concerned about it and i used to say because they just felt that, that it was the brits kind of overdoing it but that's not the case it, it was because we were we were kind of shaming them because they weren't doing it they weren't building these enormous memorials to the missing and they were they were starting to feel rather embarrassed about it you know that these big memorials that we were proposing and building uh, and yet they weren't doing doing the same thing, and they they haven't, and and so that was part of the problem. It was that they just felt that we were we were shaming, we were overdoing it. Uh, but uh, yeah, they are beautiful, and uh, in my area, obviously the biggest one is the Teepbal Memorial to the Missing, which is uh, which is extraordinary and uh, visible from from miles around and thankfully not in the place it was supposed to be because it was originally designed to go uh, very close to Poissiers on the ridge there uh, bridging the road and so the road was supposed to go with it now that road's quite a busy road now so almost certainly if it had been placed there it would now be a roundabout going round it a little bit like the Arc de Triomphe in Paris uh, and so thankfully it wasn't placed on the road and it went on to the Teep, uh, the Teepbal Ridge which is a fantastic spot uh, for the memorial to be well away from any any main road. Absolutely, and it's a. Uh, uh, I know, Pete, you you mention it, but uh, there's a lot of conjecture around Teep Val, the, the the memorial to the missing. But I quite like it. I think it I think it stands out, and it should stand out, Pete, because it was a significant event. The Somme, you know, the the first of July in 1916 was, you know, and for that reason, I think it it works in really well where it is, and and it. It's an amazing monument. Yeah. And so, Pete, we should mention, what are the, like, with you living over there, what, what do the locals feel of the uh, Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries? What, do, they, do they have a, a view on them? It's another good question, Adam. And, and again, it's, I can answer in various ways. The same as everything, really. I suppose you could go into Britain and you could talk to a large lump of the population about the First World War and they wouldn't know what you were talking about. Um, well, the same here. There are people that are very interested, interested from the point of view that um, it's it's all, all all around them or they're involved in the tourism in, in one way or another. Not that the tourism of the Great War is particularly big compared to the tourism in other in other areas. Uh, but certainly there are a lot of some people that work in, in tourism here and, and are involved. 
but there are also families and organizations here that that are, are interested there's a there's a pipe band here there's, oh, there's i won't go through them all there's lots and lots of people that are that are interested equally i remember when i first moved here my next door neighbor who was a bank manager who just could not get his head around why I was here at all and what I was aiming to do. Um, he just couldn't understand. He couldn't understand why people were interested. He hadn't realised, he'd lived here all his life as well, but he hadn't realised that, that people were coming and visiting the cemeteries. And in fact, to him, the cemeteries were just like anything else that you drive past every day, a factory or a house or a building. They were just there. They were there in the landscape, and they are. They're everywhere in the landscape. You can't avoid them. But, but like everything... Uh, that you see on a daily basis, it just becomes part of the landscape. So he just really, I had to kind of bring it to his attention for him to, 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 to notice them really, um, which, which was to, to my mind was extraordinary. But yes, I could un understand it because he, you know, they've just always been there. So generally speaking, yeah, you, you, you get no graffiti, no damage, nothing ever done to them. They're beautiful here, um, and. Uh, and yes, they, they are looked after by the local people. I mean, the, the Commonwealth War Graves gardeners are, are the locals. They are, they are recruited locally. And so the people that look after them are the local people. So it's, uh, yeah, they're, they're here uh, and they're beautiful and they are remembered uh, by the people that live here. But they're not like, like a lot of people. They're not a big part of their lives if you are not involved in the, in the tourist industry here or involved in the care of the cemeteries. So, Pete, you mentioned earlier that the seats that were that were put in cemeteries, and and for we, it brings me to my next question to ask you: Can you tell us some of the unique features that the architects built for families to use when visiting their loved ones? Because we we've got to remember, Pete, that these cemeteries weren't built for us; they were built for the pilgrims, the the original families who lost their loved ones. And and can you share with us what yeah. the what the layout? was and what the architects did for the families coming over yeah well i think uh, i think in a way they are they are built for us as well adam i suppose really because we are a continuation of those pilgrimages yes we we might not um, remember literally the the soldiers that fought and died here we might not even you know i just remember my grandfather who was here um but um uh, so I, I think it's it's a continuation, but of course at that time you have to think when these things were built, transport was not as easy as it is now. So a lot of people came by uh, the Shaman de Fer, the Iron uh, Road, the old light railway lines that crisscrossed over France, or they came on the nearest big train and then perhaps got a taxi out here, which then left them here, and so. Those seats that I mentioned are there literally for people to, to sit down to put their feet up. But of course, in inclement weather, then you needed a, a shelter to get out of the shelter. And sometimes uh, the one that instantly springs to mind uh, is in Villas Bretonneau, Adelaide Cemetery. It, it looks a little bit like a bus shelter at the end of the, I sometimes describe it as that. Uh, at the end, uh, it's a beautiful bus sh shelter, I have to say, but that is what it's for. It is for people, as as I have done many times, to to get out of uh, of pouring rain uh, and wait for it to clear, and then go back out and, and have a look at the, the graves and the cemeteries, especially if you're a relative of, of one of those that's buried there. So they were designed with with the the visitor in mind. So you have you have shelters and you have seats. And I've only noticed recently that the shelters are much more prevalent the further away that you got from any kind of rail uh, or road uh, network. So in other words, the further you had to walk, then the more likely at the end of that walk, when you got to the cemetery, uh, you were going to find some kind of shelter. Not the case in all of them, because for the small ones, there's, there's almost nothing there. The only thing that they all do have, and it makes them very, very visible, is the cross of sacrifice. It's this big Christian cross with uh, a two-handed uh, crusader sword emblazoned on the front in bronze. So you can see them from miles away, uh, the actual uh, cemeteries. Um, but yeah, there was definitely a, a practicalities in, involved. And also, you have to say, just simple things like, they have walls around them and gates, and very often that was just to stop rabbits getting in. We forget, you know, there's rabbits everywhere. They eat everything. You have more of a problem in Australia. It's nothing to do with us. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so just simple things like that. The walls rammed are very often because uh, to, to keep the rabbits out. So, but, again, architecturally, can be hedges sometimes, can be walls, uh, can be open. There are a few that have nothing around them.
So, Pete, some of these cemeteries are enormous, and we mentioned earlier Tynecott Cemetery. So how do you find your way around them? And if especially people are coming over to look for a relative in, in that cemetery? Yep. Well, very easy. Well, it is once you know how to do it. <laughs> it didn't used to be, even for myself, I used to get lost. and I still occasionally get, get confused and can't find one. But in, in theory... Um, you would look in the register. So every cemetery, barring a few, the very small ones, but most cemeteries have a register in the front. And basically that register is going to tell you a little bit of the history of the cemetery, how it, uh, how it, was, uh, how it arrives to being where it is. It's going to give you um, a list alphabetically of everybody that's within that cemetery. And it's going to have a map of the cemetery. So how do the two things go together? Well, every single soldier has uh, a series of, of letters and numbers that are indicating where he will be found. And normally, um, the first one will give you an, a- an area. So it can be, I'm going to use, um, uh, I think I'll use Villas Bresno. So it can be in Roman numerals V I I, and that will be an area. You can look on the map and you can see an area, a grouping of, uh, of graves in one corner that are all V I I. And, uh, and then it will say uh, a row number, so it will say B, and that will be a row, and you can see that there's a B for a row of graves within that area, and then it will say three, and that means it's the third grave, and to give you a clue, they then normally show on the, on the actual uh, the plan, they will show the numbering will run one to ten, and it runs from left to, to right, and so... In theory, you can very quickly discover where a relative is. And I have to say that I, generally speaking, if I'm uh, taking somebody for the first time to a cemetery and uh, I'm not uh, completely conversant with uh, how it works, I normally print out a copy, mark it already on, do a cross on the grave of where it should be, and then that, that, that helps you. It just saves, it saves a little bit of time. And in the old days, again, the registers, sometimes they were stolen. And I can understand totally why they would be stolen, because if you're a relative, you've come all the way from, let's say, from Australia to see a grave, and you find there's a little book in the door there that nobody appears to be looking at that's got his name in it. Oh, I think I'll have that. And so I never felt aggrieved uh, that people would take it. Well, that's not true. Yes, I did sometimes, especially if I'm trying to find a grave and there's no register in there. Uh, but nowadays it doesn't happen because you can download it. You can download the whole register in about 10 minutes because they're all available online. So so the, the, the registers never disappear any longer, which is which is good. Um, so, so yeah, so it, it is, you just need to practice it. It's a good thing just to practice doing it because it, they are available online, go and have a look at a few and try and work out where that would be in the cemetery uh, on, online. You can print out the uh, the plan um, and uh, yeah, have a practice. It's good fun. And Pete, we I, I mentioned Tynecott Cemetery, and for the for the people who aren't aware, it is the biggest Commonwealth War Graves cemetery in the world. It has just under twelve thousand de- war dead, and it's a it's a beautiful cemetery. It's a, it's a really You've got the you got the cross of sacrifice. You've got a couple of bunkers in there, Pete, and and German bunkers that were that were that were built. You've got a couple of Victoria Cross recipients in there. So you you can actually, Pete, you when you stand the the actual the the cross of sacrifice itself is is built on a bunker. It's actually built on a German bunker, and and when you I often get this a lot, Pete, when, when I've been there and, and you have as well, where you, you, you'll climb up the the cross of sacrifice and people will say, get down from there. You always hear it. And, and it's, you're actually, and when you can see it, Pete, there's steps, there's steps in the side of the, in the cross of sacrifice to actually, there's a, there's a seat at the top of it. And it was designed originally to look out over across the over the Messines Ridge and to see the high ground. It's it's very because you know Pete yourself the Epa Salient is very flat. It's it's not you know and and high ground and and Tynecott is a it's a beautiful cemetery. It really is and and yeah I just wanted to bring that in for people who weren't you, you know who don't know what Tynecott Cemetery is and the significance of it. Well, it's, it's uh, again it's about practicality. You know because you are on this high ground that's what the soldiers were fighting to take during the Battle of Broodsin to, to get up to those that, that high ground. Uh, and also, when you know that most of the, uh, sadly, the guys that are buried in there come from the land surrounding the, the cemetery, 
then you realize that if you get up onto the the, the, the cross of sacrifice and you sit in the in the area that uh, you're supposed to, to sit in that's uh, uh, near near the top um, then you do get a spectacular view and it was designed to do that um, I have to say there are some some locations where things have changed and one of them uh, would be Teatball. Teatball was originally designed and most people don't know this that you could climb up to the top of Teatball and look out but it was very quickly discovered that it spoiled the it spoiled the memorial somehow to have people hanging about at the top of it it, it just didn't doesn't wouldn't have looked good and you, you only have to look now and go and stand beneath it and look up and think well, if i could see people waving to me down from the top would it be a good imagery and i don't think it would um and you know adam as well as i do that that we can do that at the australian national memorial at villas bretano because there is a tower at the end there designed by the same architect lutians and there we can climb to the top. But there's something about that tower that make, means that when you kind of hang out the top and look across the battlefield, it, it, it feels it's the right thing to do there. Uh, and I certainly, I think, uh, at, at, uh, at Teat Valley, it, it wouldn't have felt that. But there, when you're up there, but it's partly because most of your body's hidden behind a high wall, I suppose. And uh, at, at Teat Valley, it's not. Uh, yeah, the, the wall's quite a low wall, or it would have been a low wall. Um, but yeah, the view from the, the top of the... Uh, the tower at Villas Breton, at the Australian National Memorial, is, is spectacular, isn't it? When you the stairs, Pete, when you climb those stairs, you you know when you get to the top, you you think, geez, that's a that's a fair it's a fair hike, but uh, it's worth it. No, not very not very often, Adam. I don't know. I say, hey, guys, you go to the top and have a look. Tell me what you can see. I'll wait here. <laughs> yes, no, it's it it is a, it is a, it is a fair hike. And when when people when people do get back there, Pete, I, I highly recommend that they go and do that. And so. We should mention, Pete, that so the the maintenance of this of these cemeteries is is huge, and and the cost is so. Who who looks after yeah. these cemeteries because they're beautiful, and and who pays for them? Yeah, well, it is the Commonwealth uh, War Graves, and uh, they're based. Um, well, the, the nearest headquarters here is uh, in a place called Bahrain's, which is uh, just part of uh, of Arras. But their overall headquarters is Maidenhead back in, in the in the UK. But interestingly, at Bahrain's here, and you can go to something now called the uh, the um, CWGC experience, and you can go and have a look at where they cut the headstones because all of the headstones are actually cut worldwide. They're cut here uh, just on the outskirts of Arras. So it's well worth going to have a look at the Commonwealth War Graves experience. Um, and um, as I said earlier, local gardeners uh, employed local people for uh, a lot, a lot of the uh, the gardening. Overseers come from the nearest uh, Commonwealth country, uh, and they're funded by us. Uh, well, not by me because I pay my taxes to France now, but uh, for you and me when I lived in the UK, then certainly our taxes. Uh, uh, part of of that uh, goes into a, a pot, and it's ratioed by the number of war dead from each Commonwealth country as to how much is paid to the uh, to the uh, Commonwealth war graves. So that's that, that's how it works. Effectively, we, we pay for it. And and obviously, Pete, in the summer you see, like in the northern summer, you see these teams out, like the gardening teams. They're out. They often, Pete, there's there's that much activity with the with the teams coming through. That so, but now that they're mobile, Pete, before they were mobile, they, there was a garden shed, wasn't there? They and they had their little spades and everything. Yep. Yep. So so I'll just explain what what Adam uh, what Adam's talking about there. It, it, in the past. Each cemetery had its own gardener, basically, or more than one for the big, bigger ones, and they needed to keep their tools there. So part of the design, and I should have mentioned it when we're talking about the bush shelters, very often beside the old thing that looks like the bush shelter, which is a shelter to get you out the rain, then you'll have, uh, you'll have a gardener's uh, shed, which, again, are very attractive, matches in part of the architectural design of the cemeteries. Normally an oaken door, big oak door, you open it, and when well, you don't, because they don't use them anymore, but if you could open it, and there would have been a barrow and a spade and a hoe and all the rest of the implants needed to keep the cemeteries tidy. Nowadays, it's mobile teams, so they, they, they uh, go around in vehicles and they move from cemetery to cemetery uh, doing whatever they, they need to do. Um, and those are the gardening teams. But what I should say, there are also other guys that come and work here. Sometimes they're contract workers nowadays, but there are stonemasons and tree surgeons and uh, 
Everybody else that is needed, they even have it at the CWGC headquarters at Bahrain's. They have uh, blacksmiths who repair the gates. So it's an enormous, uh, an ongoing effort, of course. That's a great thing as well. It's a job for life for anybody that gets employed here by the Commonwealth War Graves. You know, you're not going to be uh, be made redundant because this will 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 carry uh, carry on. Um, there have been some changes uh, just recently that. Uh, upset some of the Brits out here because as we left again to do with Brexit, one of the other big issues here at the moment. And uh, uh, so a lot of the, the Brits that were working here as supervisors uh, uh, lost some of their money. Um, but that seems to have all been sorted out and uh, we're, we're, we're cracking on again here. So it's, uh, yeah, and they're here, it's, it's all year round. So it's not just the uh, the summer. There's always something going on in perhaps more stuff, I suppose, in the winter as they're clearing out plants and uh, thinning them down and replanting and putting bulbs in and preparing for uh, for uh, for the next year's uh, flowering. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's continuous and uh, yeah, it's great. I have to say uh, that I've got quite a few plants in my garden from the CWGC cemeteries because when they're thinning out, they throw them outside of the cemeteries and they're waiting to be composted. And I think oh, that's a waste to compost that. I think I'll probably have that for my garden. <laughs> so uh, a lot of the plants in my garden uh, have come from the plants waiting to be composted from the cemeteries don't tell anybody <laughs> i won't pete i won't <laughs> as i mentioned pete you you are fortunate and lucky enough to be a battlefield guide and, and can you share with us some of the most memorable experience you have witnessed when taking your clients to visit relatives in one of these cemeteries uh yes that's uh not, well it's not a difficult question because i get a lot of uh, very emotional people um, and I think it's judging one of the things that you have to do is to judge when to leave people alone when to stop talking which is difficult in my case stop talking Pete and just leave them alone because you can see it welling up sometimes uh, and uh, and some people need to cry they need to get uh, uh, to get upset they need to get it out of this they've come a long way and I think perhaps my most memorable was uh, would be two Aust uh, uh, Canadian ladies who were actually New Newfoundlanders, uh, and uh, we travelled following one of their relatives' footsteps for a long time, and they got upset in several locations. And when they got upset, they really got upset, and they howled at the top of their voices. And I just had to kind of bail out quick. And I just, I was dreading when we were going to get to where one of their relatives actually lost his life. We knew exactly where he'd lost his life. He lost his life crossing a, a lock gate and a lock gate was still there. He was running across the top of it. Uh, and when I got there, I literally took them there and said, this is the lock gate. I'll see you in a little while. <laughs> and I ran away quickly because I knew they were going to get really, really upset. And they did. Um, but it, it, yeah, and that's one of the things you have to do is just judge your moment to, uh, as to when to leave to let people but other times they want you to stay and they want you to be involved in, in their commemoration of their relative, especially if you've done a lot of research. Uh, and so sometimes they stay. I can honestly say the most moving ceremony I've ever been to was a padre himself. And he was a padre visiting a padre, one of his relatives who died on the Western Front as a padre. And he bought the full communion set and everything. And he laid it all out in front of the grave and, uh, and said uh, communion for him. It was just, just marvellous and upsetting and moving uh, and extraordinary. Uh, so I have seen some, some fantastic uh, uh, little mini services, you'd have to say, that people put on sometimes for their, for their relatives. And sometimes I've been involved in, 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 in creating them. So it's, yeah, there's all of these different things, but all of them uh, uh, wonderful, really, in one way or another. So one of the, the first impressions that hit you, Pete, when, you, when you're over in, in a war cemetery is the row and row, as I've mentioned, of dead. While normal cemeteries contain people who died from a variety of causes and represents a wide range of age, military cemeteries provide graphic physical evidence of the price of war. Do you think that one of the roles that the war cemeteries play is to remind current and future generations of what the true cost of war is? Oh, yeah. I mean, they have to because they, it is so uh, visual. Um, and But it's one of those oddities, isn't it? And not a, Some people don't like it. Some people, and I don't mean that in the don't like cemeteries. 
I just mean that they find it just yet another cemetery. You know, and I suppose in the areas where there are no big block houses, there are no big um, uh, perhaps memorials even, the only way that you can tell that, that anything ever happened here is by the cemeteries. There's, you know, there's quite a few places, especially on the Aris battlefield, I would say, where you're, you're away from everything and all are, are, are a cemetery, then another cemetery, another cemetery, but you look round and there's no sign of any battle, there's no, there's no sign of any trenches, there's nothing to tell you anything went on. So, that, that, so it, it, it can be, to some people, I suppose they find them boring and that's the bit, the, the bit that I don't like. I, I, I don't think they're boring and I try to educate people that these do teach you something about warfare. These, these, these are the physical remains of those beneath these headstones of those that fought and, and died here so yeah they can't uh, they can't but help but help uh help explain to you the actual cost of warfare and they do it much better of course than a memorial because a memorial is just a memorial and and you don't get that feeling of of of, of literal of being amongst the dead which you do when you're when you're standing in the, in the middle of a cemetery so no they are important and uh, and certainly that's one of the reasons why school groups, I suppose, are brought, are brought here because it's very, it's very, very visual. And unlike a cemetery, as I say, the cemeteries of my youth, when we went into the church cemeteries uh, all over England, exploring them, uh, you knew that those people died in multiple different circumstances, accidents, yes, occasionally warfare, they died, being brought back and uh, died of wounds, but in the main, they're dying of old age. And so it's very different when you look at the ages of the, and that's, I suppose, the, the other thing that people look at on the headstones are the ages of those that, are, that have, have, have died uh, uh, during, the, during the war. So, Pete, you mentioned school groups and we talk about children. How do children and young people respond in the cemeteries? Um, again, very, very different. I actually like taking young people around the battlefields, full stop, and of course, for all the battlefields, you have to say, in most cases, it's the cemeteries, because they, they, they react differently to adults and they ask different questions and uh, they're interested and yet some, some, somehow, sometimes with a, a bit of innocence, which means that, that they can ask questions that adults sometimes don't like to ask. And I suppose that's what I gain more from taking students around the battlefields myself is that you get these unusual uh, uh, questions that an adult perhaps wouldn't ask. But also, I, I get odd, I remember, it's, it's a story I tell quite often, really, and it's, it's a sad story in, in many ways, and yet one that eventually kind of hit home to this young girl. This was a young Australian girl I, I took around, and she was from a wealthy family, and hence, because of that, she had a whole list of officers that her parents had told us to visit because they were relatives. Make sure you get a picture of this relative and this relative and this relative, of course, graves. Um, and I had them on tour for quite, quite some time. I think it was three or four days. And uh, at each cemetery, you know, she'd be wheeled out, and they'd say, the, the teachers would say to her, can you stand over there by you behind your relative's uh, a headstone and she would and she was always smiling with a, a a silly smile not a just a pleasant smile it was a silly smile and and I could see the teachers getting irritated with her a little bit and you know, but you can't you know if that's just face she, she wanted to put on anyway the last visit to the last cemetery and the last of her relatives she came across to talk to me and I have to say she'd been with a group of people who were not interested really in the tour at all and you, you certainly got to feel that it was it was mum and dad paying for her to uh, to get get her out of their hair for a, a little while. So eventually, this uh, this young girl on the last cemetery, the last visit, she came across to have a chat with me, and she just said, she said, um, "Please, sir," she said, "Where are they actually buried?" And I said, "Here." I said, "You're standing on the grave of where they are," and she burst out crying. And it, uh, I could see the teachers behind, literally with their heads in their hands, because she'd just not been listening enough. She thought that all the headstones were just memorials. She didn't realise they were graves. And it dawned on me, she'd never seen a grave before. She'd probably never been in a cemetery before. And because she hadn't been listening, she just looked at each one of these headstones and thought it's some kind of memorial. She didn't know they were buried beneath them. Um, and, yeah, it was just so, so extraordinary. Uh, but, yeah, so, so, yeah, many and varied as ever that, that you get with, uh, with young people. So, Pete, what kind of information can be can you find on the War Graves Commission website to help people who are researching a relative? 
Yeah, well, the first thing is to actually find them, to to find where they're commemorated. So it's completely alphabetical um, uh, for uh, literally, if you've got a surname uh, and a Christian name and hopefully a, a, a regiment, you, you will find them. If you've got a name like mine, Smith, then it's a little bit more fiddly and you have to do a little bit more more research to kind of narrow down. Uh, but in, in theory, if you've, got, if you've got enough information, then you should be able to find them. And once you've found them, then uh, uh, that will tell you where they are commemorated on which memorial or which where they're buried. Um, it will then, as we've discussed, it will give you the uh, basically the, the directions, I suppose. It will give you the map reference of where they are within the cemetery. One of the things they never tell you on the Commonwealth War Graves uh, uh, documentation is how they die. Uh, and that could be one of three three reasons, I suppose, died. And that covers uh, anything that you would normally die of in civilian life. So it can be a heart attack, it can be run over by a bus or something like that. Something not war related, effectively, that would be classed as died. Um, and then the others are fairly obvious, killed in action or died of wounds. Um, but they don't say. The Commonwealth War Graves don't say. It, and it's that... It's that uh, inclusiveness, I suppose. In death, it doesn't matter what rank you are or, or how you died, uh, you're all the same. And that's something that they, that they were very keen on. And I think it's something we should have mentioned earlier, um, that in death, the, you're all the same. Um, so, uh, so, yes, it was, uh, it was one of the key parts of, of, what they, of what they wanted. So, Pete, how can people help ensure that the cemeteries remain a place for people to visit their relatives and what do you see for the future of of these cemeteries well the cemeteries should remain unless something ridiculous happens i would have to say i think it's happened you know this the covid really has been a, a big test really for for a lot of a, a lot of people um because because the gardeners have been really working without anybody for a on, you know, it'll be two years with almost very few people visiting um, and that's really the key is, is to visit and of course to to show you visited there is a visitor's book in every cemetery or the the, the, the main ones the, the bulk of them um, and there what you need to do is to is to sign that visitor's book because that is is proof that you visited uh, people often say, "Why do they? Why do they have visitors' books? Because what do they do with them? Well, actually, they throw them away. Um, people imagine that there's a big storeroom somewhere of all the visitors' books from the past, and of course there isn't. Um, but what they will do is they will count to see how many people have have, have visited, um, and that's done just just out of you know interest. They want to know are they wasting their time, and. Uh, with the possibility that at some stage, I suppose, if everything went all horribly wrong, then they, they may close a cemetery down uh, and, and move the bodies if nobody was visiting. And occasionally you do get cemeteries. And I know a few in the area here that very rarely get visitors. It's because of where they are. It's just difficult to get to. Um, I remember once going to a cemetery w within a six-month period and uh, I would signed it. And the only person that had signed it in between me and... So I, uh, I, yeah, I visited a little cemetery that's really out the way, and, and what I discovered in a six-month period that I was literally the only other person that had been in there was the Commonwealth War Graves in Inspector, and there is a guy that goes around to check that the cemeteries are looking good, that the gardeners have been doing their job, and he signs it to say he's been. And yeah, there was only me, and then and then him, and then six months later, me again. Nobody had. Uh, People may have visited, but nobody had signed, signed the book. And I actually suspect that very few people have visited. So, so yeah, make sure if you do go to a cemetery, then, uh, yeah, sign the visitor's book to see you've been. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with Pete more. Like, it is just sign that book. It, it is, you know, absolutely sign that book. And every time I go over Pete, I, I, every cemetery I go into, I, I make it a – it's like a regimental thing to, to sign the book sign the book because it's important yeah. because they do they do check yeah. Pete they do actually check the books and yeah, they do. and no, they well don't. in yeah. the last 2 years yeah. it's probably only been the you know the old visitor yourself who've been lucky to to get out and and to the cemeteries yeah. and the gardeners and that sort of thing but yeah not many visitors at the moment Thankfully, I should, yeah, I should say that, that thankfully, since we've opened up again with some of the other European countries, then uh, the Dutch kind of do us proud. The Dutch come very often to the cemeteries here, and uh, considering they didn't uh, fight and they were a neutral country in the First World War, I always find it interesting that there are, there are so many Dutch visitors, and so it's nice to see Dutch names in the, 
in the visitors' books. It's it is it, it's good to see, Pete. I, I still think the Great War, even after a hundred years, Pete. I think it's still today is as important as it was just after it finished. I I, I think, like you said, in the sixties there was there was a real you know, it, there was a real fear that it wouldn't be remembered and and you know things were on the wayside. But it's just not the case now. And I think, Pete, a lot of people are itching to get back uh, to the battlefields when we can. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they are. <laughs> Pete, it brings me to my last question, and it's it's sort of you, you might have to do a bit of imagining on this one, and and I'll 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 ask it to you and see your thoughts. So, if they could speak, what do you think the war dead would say to the living about these cemeteries? It's very simple: keep visiting. That's that's what they'd say. They're, I mean, there's no point. In, in all the care and effort that goes in, because it, it was, it's yes, it's for the men, but, but all that care and effort that goes in by the Commonwealth War Graves is for us. It's, it's for us, the relatives, the friends, the interested, to go and see their graves and to, and to have a look at how well they're, they're, they're cared for. And so that's the thing I, that I would say. If nobody goes and nobody visits, then all the effort is wasted uh, and they're not remembered. And I think they need to be remembered. And the way to remember them and to revere them and, and to talk about them is to, is to, is to go and visit uh, where, they, where they, they rest. Absolutely. I couldn't have put it better myself, Pete. And I think that is, that is what we need to do is, as, as soon as we're allowed to travel again, Pete, especially from Australia, it's something that we should do. We, we definitely should remember our, our war dead and, and commemorate them in, in any way we can. And on that note, Pete, I think it's a great way to end the show. And thank you so much for giving your time to, to come on and, and talk about war grave cemeteries. I, I think it's so important and it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And you continue to learn all the time. There's always something new to learn and, and I'm, I'm still learning. I'm just going to mention, if you don't mind, I just wanted to mention two books, uh, Empires of yeah, the Dead. Yeah, Pete, please. Yeah, Empires of the Dead by david crane uh, and that one's uh, basically uh, it's about the creation of the uh, of uh, the uh, the commonwealth war graves the imperial war graves uh, as it was called so that, that's a really really good book and then there's one uh, which i've only discovered just recently and it's by richard van emden who's a popularist writer and it's called uh, missing the need for closure after the great war which um that one it's uh yeah it's great uh it's very very highly recommend it to read i'm, I'm not quite finished it i'm really enjoying it oh that th- thank you pete oh for the listeners go out and buy those books and no pete thank you it's yeah. it's been great to have you on and and talk about a very important topic and and give a bit of understanding for people of how the commonwealth war graves commission was was brought into fruition and also how Commonwealth War Grave Cemeteries actually work. So, Pete Smith, thank you very much for coming on True Blue History. Uh, a pleasure, Adam. Very, ni- very, very nice to, uh, to be asked again. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts. And if you feel like supporting us, you can now via our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash True Blue History or buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash true blue history and check out our new website trueblue for more great content.